This program is brought to you by Emory University. Welcome back and to take their seats. Uh, now that the insulin resistance is setting in, I'd like to welcome us to the second panel of the day, and that is Binding the Future, Global Settlements, and the Death of Representative Litigation. Moderating the panel today will be Professor Thomas C. Arthur, LQC Lamar Professor of Law here at Emory. Thomas Arthur has been a faculty member, member here at Emory since 1982, specializing in antitrust, civil procedure, and administrative law. He has also served as Dean of the Law School and Vice Provost of the University. Prior to joining the Emory faculty, he was a partner with Kirkland and Ellis in the Washington, D.C. office. He has degrees from both Duke and Yale Law School. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we've got an exciting panel here. Uh, I know it's going to be difficult to top what we saw this morning, but we're going to make a shot at it. Uh, I have four uh, very distinguished commentators uh, who teach and write in the civil procedure area, uh, and particularly with an emphasis on aggregate litigation. Uh, I'll refer you to uh, their biographies in the program rather than taking up time reciting their many, many accomplishments that each one of them has. Uh, so I'll just suffice to say that we're going to start off with Professor Rhonda Wasserman, who's a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Uh, Rhonda is going to be followed, I'm sorry, yeah, is going to be followed by Georgine Vero, uh, who teaches at Loyola of Los Angeles School of Law. Uh, Dean will be followed by Ed Sherman, who, like me, is also a refugee from the Deaning Wars, and this is, is Professor Kane, uh, and he's, he and, all, and I have both come to our senses. Uh, but he will be uh, a third speaker. He has been a professor at, and dean at Tulane Law School, is now professor there. And then concluding our panel uh, will be Linda Mullinax, who teaches at the University of Texas School of Law. And each of our panelists will go for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have discussions and questions among the panel, and then some time for questions from the audience. So without further ado, Rhonda, if you can take the floor. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Tim Wilson and the editors of the Yale uh, excuse me, Emory Law Journal, uh, <laughs> and the Thrower family for its generous support for today's program. Um, the starting assumption in uh, negotiations, in judicial opinions, in symposia like this, is that defendants insist upon global peace. Before explaining why they're not likely to get what they want, um, I want to spend just a couple of minutes unpacking uh, their objective. So defendants want global peace, a once and for all resolution of, their, of the claims against them for a variety of reasons. First, they want to cap and define their total exposure. They want to know what it's going to cost them to resolve all of the claims against them. Second, they not only want to define and cap that exposure, they actually want to reduce what it's going to cost them by reducing their transaction costs. So if there are 1,000 claims against them and it's going to cost $1,000 to resolve each of those claims, they want to write one check for a million dollars rather than litigate those 1,000 claims to judgment and end up paying a second million dollars in attorney's fees. Third, when defendants talk about a need for closure or a need for global peace, they're not just talking about an end to the obvious financial costs of the litigation. They're seeking a lot more than that. They want to avoid the distraction that the litigation uh, causes from core business functions. They want to minimize the public relations disaster caused by not just the litigation, but the underlying product failure. They want to reassure their investors and the like. Finally, they want to uh, eliminate the risk of follow-up claimants. So we're all familiar with the expression, if you build it, they will come. If you shut it down, they will go away. And defendants want to signal that they are uh, discouraging future claimants from keep on coming. Now, defendants are not the only parties that benefit from global peace. 
There's the judge who clears her docket, who burnishes her reputation as the judge who saw an end to the litigation morass. Claimants, too, can benefit from global settlements or uh, global uh, judgments. Uh, they can get their money sooner. Maybe they can get more money if the defendant is able to avoid bankruptcy or if the defendant is able to reduce its transaction costs. Future claimants, in particular, may benefit from a global settlement if funds are specifically set aside for their benefit rather than run the risk that the current claimants will exhaust the defendant's resources. So we understand why defendants insist on global peace and how it might even benefit other parties. But notwithstanding its many possible benefits, global peace is often an unattainable goal. It's an unattainable goal because some future claimants can't be bound by a class action judgment and they can't consent to an aggregate settlement. To understand why certain future claimants at least can't be bound, it's important to understand that when we talk about the category of future claimants, that category is both uh, fluid and diverse. So in terms of fluidity, the boundaries between and among current claimants, future claimants, and the public at large are porous and fluid. An individual with known symptoms is a current claimant today, but that same person may also develop additional symptoms in the future, and so to that extent is both a current claimant and a future claimant simultaneously. An individual exposed to a deleterious substance who suffers no symptoms today we would view as a future claimant. But tomorrow, when that person develops a symptom and files a lawsuit, that future claimant is now, of course, a current claimant. And an individual who's been exposed to a deleterious substance who has experienced no um, untoward uh, symptoms yet, we view that person, or I'm viewing that person, as a future claimant. But what differentiates that person from all of us? We've all been exposed, or maybe not you very young people, but most of us uh, have been exposed to secondhand smoke in a bar. Uh, are we future claimants too? So there's this concern or this issue, not really a concern, but this issue of the fluidity between future claimants and the public at large. We not only need to acknowledge that the category of uh, future claimants uh, melds into the other categories, but also that there's diversity among the future claimants. So there are uh, differences in terms of knowledge of exposure. There are individuals who say have had uh, defective artificial heart valves. They know of their problem. Uh, they can be identified. They understand the risks that they face. We can contrast them with uh, guys who worked in a shipyard 30 years ago who don't even realize that they were exposed to uh, asbestos. We can refer to those future claimants as not just unknown, but unknowing. There are other ways in which the category uh, of future claimants within that category, there are differences. There are people who have a claim only by virtue of their relationship with an exposed individual, it's conceivable that the prospective claimant is not yet in the relationship with the exposed individual if it's a, loss of, a potential loss of consortium claim. So that person, obviously, is unknowing. There are prospective future claimants who are not yet born. So they may be exposed to the substance themselves in utero, or they may have a claim uh, upon birth by virtue of uh, being the child of an exposed individual, but obviously within the category of future claimants, there's a fair bit of diversity among them. Now these unknowing future claimants, those who are not aware of their exposure, those who are not yet in a relationship through which they will have a claim, those who are not yet born, those folks can't be bound by a class action judgment. Due process requires at a minimum adequate representation, and at least with respect to those not within the personal jurisdictional reach of the court, notice and an opportunity to be heard. But the unknowing future claimants can't be notified. Certainly the unborn and those not yet in a relationship with the exposed individual can't be provided with meaningful notice. And even if the defendant could identify all of those exposed to its products, including those, excuse me, including those unaware of their exposure, 
The value of that notice would be questionable at best. How can an individual decide whether to remain in a class or to exclude herself when she doesn't know when, whether, or how she will be injured? So I think it's obvious that notice to certain knowing, excuse me, to even knowing future claimants can be of limited utility. Now, Mullane required only, quote, notice reasonably calculated under all the circumstances to apprise interested parties of the pendency of the action and permitted the state in that case, quote, to dispense with certain notice to those beneficiaries whose interests were either conjectural or future. So even if due process requires only adequacy of representation and not notice, it may be difficult to assure the absent future prospective claimants adequate representation. We, ne we need look no further than AMCAM or Hansberry for that matter to realize that there will be certain conflicts of interest or there may be certain conflicts of interest that would render representation inadequate. In allocating limited resources among absent class members, we can't expect the known individuals with known problems to adequately represent the unknown and unknowing individuals with uncertain problems. It may be that subclasses with separate representation could alleviate many of these conflicts, but they, spit, they still may not be able to provide adequate representation. It may be difficult to anticipate today the contributions that medical science will make tomorrow. So if there's a reason today to question causation, and if those doubts about causation justify lower recoveries for class members today, medical science may change our understanding, and those doubts may no longer linger, and so we may, the, there are questions again about the adequacy of representation provided by the current claimants. Another area in which science could render representation inadequate is that there may be treatment options available uh, tomorrow that we can't even anticipate today. So there are a, a variety of reasons why we need to question um, the adequacy of representation that could be afforded to the prospective future claimants. It's not only that um, the unknowing future claimants can't be bound by a class action judgment, but they can't really participate or take advantage of the ingenious new non-class aggregate settlement options that have been developed post-Ortiz. Uh, a Vioxx type settlement, there was very brief reference to Vioxx earlier today, um, such a settlement would require attorneys for the um, absentees to uh, recommend a settlement to their inventory of clients and to withdraw from representation in the event that the client doesn't accept that settlement. That type of option can't be used with respect to the unknowing future claimants because they're not represented by counsel, so there's no lawyer who could sign such an agreement. Likewise, the uh, pre-settlement consents contemplated by the ALI principles on aggregate litigation, whereby class members agree, or, or, or not class members, excuse me, these are non-class settlements, but the, the mass of individuals agree in advance to accept a settlement that's approved by a supermajority of the claimants, that option too will not work with respect to certain future claimants because they can't consent to claims that they're not even aware that they have. So, if unknowing future claimants can't be bound by a class action judgment and they can't consent to a non-class aggregate settlement, it may be that defendants can't get all that they want, global peace. The question is whether they can get what they need. Building upon the work of Linda Mullinex and Deborah Hensler, I want to sketch out one possible roadmap that defendants might follow and then consider whether it might provide the defendants with what they need. First, the defendants would have to negotiate a fair and reasonable settlement with the, uh, of the current claims with the current claimants and secure judicial approval uh, in the context of a class action. Then outside the class action, the defendant would make future claimants what I'm calling fair offers as their claims mature. To be fair, the offer would provide comparable terms uh, on the theory that individuals with comparable injuries should receive comparable, comparable recoveries regardless of when their claims mature. But of course, 
we would need to take into account uh, time value of money. There would need to be an inflation protection built in there because if it's fair to uh, compensate someone with a particular injury for $100,000 today, that's not going to be adequate in 10 years from now. Um, there also would need to be some provision to take into account the changes in medical science that I alluded to a moment ago. And in addition to those things, the defendant, I think, would need to waive certain defenses, including statute of limitations and statute of repose defenses, on the theory that once these future claimants learn of their um, injuries, we don't want them running into court and suing if the hope is that they will participate or accept this uh, offer. So once their claims accrue, the future class members could accept these offers on comparable terms, or they could reject them and sue in tort. This private offer to future claimants on comparable terms is somewhat reminiscent of the pre-1966 version of Rule 23, which Professor Miller recalls, uh, which permitted absentees a right of one-way intervention. A principal risk of that approach is that the plaintiffs with poor claims with weak claims will accept the offer and that those with strong claims will reject the offer and sue in tort. How likely is that risk? I want to spend just a minute looking at the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, which provides one example of a voluntary plan that, ex that achieved an exceedingly high participation rate. Some 97% of the eligible families made claims against the fund rather than sued in tort. Now, there certainly are very important differences between a government-funded fund like the 9-11 fund and these defendant-funded uh, voluntary plans that I'm contemplating here. But I cite to the 9-11 fund because we have available to us the report of the special master, Ken Feinberg, who commented on or identified for us the features of the fund that he thought uh, contributed to its success. It was transparent so that families could know in advance or at least have a pretty good idea of adv in advance of their likely recovery. It was certain and expeditious, at least as compared to litigation. It moved much more quickly and it was much more certain. The fund staff were proactive, supportive, and receptive. They reached out to the families. They uh, resolved doubts in favor of the families. They helped the family secure the information that they would need to make the strongest case possible. And finally, the program was designed to empower the families so that they could, bless you, they could um, uh, have individual meetings with the decision makers, informal meetings, they could have formal hearings uh, for which they could feel like they had their day in court, they could present the strongest case possible to the decision makers. If defendants negotiated a fair class action settlement and offered comparable terms to the future claimants as their claims accrue, the question is whether such a private system would have these same benefits. It would certainly be transparent. Presumably there would be a grid from the class action settlement that the, bless you, the prospective future claimants could look to to see what their claims, what their recoveries were going to be. It would be uh, fast and recovery would be assured. Um, as compared to litigation, which would be much slower, where recovery would be in doubt. Um, it would be even better if there were a way to ensure that the lawyers representing the future claimants uh, accepted a reduced fee in light of the limited role that they would play in representing these clients, the, those accepting the offers. Um, it's not likely that the private administration of the type of fund that I'm contemplating would be as proactive, would be as supportive, um, as the 9-11 fund, it's not likely that the claimants would feel as empowered as the, uh, those participating in the 9-11 fund. But the certainty and the speed of the system, coupled with the waiver of the defenses, should make the offers attractive to many future claimants. So the ultimate question is whether such a system would provide the defendants not with what they want, but with enough of what they need. The plan would not formally cap their liability. It wouldn't formally cap their exposure because it wouldn't be binding on the future claimants, and, um, but, but it would give the defendant a strong incentive at the time it negotiated the class action settlement with the current claimants. 
It would give the defendant an incentive at that time to try to accurately estimate the number of prospective future claimants to negotiate a settlement with the current claimants that it could afford to offer on comparable terms to future claimants as their claims accrue with the adjustments that we've already discussed. And if it attracted at least most of those future claimants, it would provide at least a de facto cap. The plan would significantly reduce attorney's fees and other transaction costs. I mean, it's not costless. The defendant would need to develop a notice system that would reach these people as their claims accrue. There would need to be some payment to a plan administrator to run the program. But attorney's fees, which make up the vast majority of the transaction costs in litigation, would be greatly reduced. While such a scheme would not be binding and it would not assure the defendants with closure with the global peace that they want, if it attracted most of the future claimants, it would achieve a significant degree of closure, allow the defendants to assuage their shareholders, investors, and, and others in the market, and try to move on from the, uh, from the morass. Finally, while the scheme would not eliminate the risk of follow-up plaintiffs, it would manage that risk by settling their claims on comparable terms to those offered to the current claimants. And in my view, defendants are not entitled to more than that. So in conclusion, um, I don't believe that unknowing future claimants can be bound by a class action judgment. I don't believe that they can consent to a settlement in one of these non-class aggregate settlements. But it may be that defendants can get most of what they need by settling the class action with the current claimants on fair terms and by offering the prospective future claimants as their claims accrue comparable terms. Thank you, and I look forward to your comments at the end. Time, and because most of the other panelists have already said what I was going to say, I'm going to go off script a little bit, and uh, so I apologize if I'm a little bit less than coherent. Um, and I want to thank Rhonda for um, setting the table for this particular panel so well, um, because I wanted to begin by saying that I think that if you look at the charge of our panel, which is basically that um, uh, global settlements are always good for defendants and never good for class members, I, I, I think is a rather debatable assumption, as, as you have demonstrated. Um, it assumes, first of all, that class actions are a viable settlement tool, and given what we heard this morning in terms of the possible death or demise of class actions, um, we have to remember that we have to make a distinction between two different kinds of class or representative actions. You have your class actions that are brought by a plaintiff uh, who wants to um, use the filing of the class action and the potential for class certification as a nuclear bomb over the head of the defendants. Um, and yes, uh, uh, Comcast and Walmart and various other decisions have made that a lot more difficult. But when it comes to class action settlements, I think there's a little bit of a different equation. And there have been a number of decisions since uh, Walmart, um, D.B. Sullivan out of the Third Circuit, AIG out of the Second Circuit, uh, the BP case out of the Fifth Circuit that have blessed class action settlements and basically pick up on the idea from Justice Ginsburg and AMCHEM that you know, class settlements are different. Um, it also assumes that uh, future claimants are a real problem. And I was going to say, yes, that's true. And you've demonstrated that. And I think that um, apart from asbestos, we have the NFL concussion case, which uh, a proposed settlement was just struck down there, largely because we didn't know how different people in the future were going to be treated. Um, and I also think that the idea of futures um, uh, touches on something that Marty Reddish talked about this morning. There's a slew of issues in terms of how do we determine whether we have a cohesive class, standing issues, ascertainability issues, and perhaps, as even Arthur Miller said this morning, uh, class action lawyers went too far in defining these overbroad um, classes. So, so I think that there is always going to be this, this, this problem. Uh, it also assumes the future claimants will necessarily be bound, and again, as Rhonda has suggested, that's not necessarily true, and I'm going to talk about the Stevenson case a little bit going forward. 
Um, and as I said, settlements are always good for defendants, but always bad for class members, I think, is very debatable as well. Now, I wanted to go into the history of um, class actions and uh, spend a little time with that going all the way back to the case of the rector of Bar Barkway, 1199. Um, but I think you'll, I'll spare you that even though it's kind of a fun case. Uh, but let me just say one thing about that case. That was a case where the plaintiff was the rector of Bar Barkway and his claim was against four parishioners as representatives of a class of other parishioners. Apparently, the uh, good rector was charging them tons of money to bury their dead. So the parishioners were carrying the bodies up the hill and refusing to pay. So the rector of Barkway sues them uh, in a representative action, and the uh, Chantry Court at the time, 1199, said that was fine. Well, eventually, the Chancery Court decided that it had to impose some rules on, on, on uh, uh, I guess, just not representative actions, but all rules. Rick Marcus wasn't around at the time, but they must have had some sort of an advisory committee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were around, then I was around, and yeah. Um, so anyway, the first rule, and I think this is part of what causes the mischief that we're, we're, ta we're talking about now, um, first, the necessary party rule evolved, which requires certain parties to be joined uh, so that they could properly be bound by the judgment in order to give relief to the parties, complete relief to the parties. That led, in turn, to the representative party rule, uh, because sometimes the parties were too numerous to be joined. So basically, under the representative party rule, they would be deemed to be joined and thus bound by the action. So this leads to the curious paradox that we've still been dealing with. Um, the indispensable party rule stated that when the absentees were few in number, the action could not proceed without them, lest they be bound, while the representative suit provision stated that if the absentees were numerous, the action could proceed without them because they would be bound. Um, and we have very, very early cases, I think, uh, uh, Chancy versus May, 1722 case, uh, another Chancery Court. And I think that this was actually the paradigm, serves as a paradigm class action case that provides us our problems today. Uh, the London stock market crashes in 1718. A group of shareholders bring a representative lawsuit uh, against the uh, mismanagement on the part of the folks uh, handling the company. Uh, the defendants argued that the case should not proceed because not all the stakeholders were joined. And the chancellor basically said, sorry. Um, and I'm not going to go through their entire language, but basically what they adopted is the idea of the adequate representation principle, uh, which later was basically codified in Hansberry versus Lee in 1940, so picked up here. Um, but they also said that if, if we don't do this, then there can be no coming at justice. Uh, and maybe there's not a better way to do it, but this sort of expedience principle uh, enters the fray. Um, I think we talked enough this morning about the disaster of the original uh, Rule 23 and the different categories that were created at the time. But I think the biggest problem was that whether or not you had preclusion, whether or not people would be bound, would depend on the type of class action that was being prosecuted. Well, in 1960, the Advisory Committee on the Civil Rules was reconstituted and they began to go to work. And, uh, um, Arthur Miller, of course, uh, was involved in this process. But I think it's worth it to talk a little bit about the debate at the time. Uh, John Frank was the leading proponent um, against doing anything with Rule 23b3. Uh, then it was called the spurious class action. He thought you should get rid of b3 altogether. Why? Because individual autonomy. Each person should have a right to litigate. Uh, and enforcing judgments against absent class members violates due process. But then, almost more relevant to today, he said he would beware of class counsel who are willing to settle an action on less than the most favorable terms in exchange for an award of lucrative attorney's fees. But he was also worried about defendants, and he thought that they would end up selling a settlement to the lowest bidder willing to settle a class action. So basically, he didn't trust anybody. <laughs> Ben Kaplan, on the other hand, uh, as Arthur told us this morning, uh, was a champion of reforming Rule 23b3 uh, for many of the reasons that I think bear repeating. Um, eliminating b3 would be retrogressive. The law was heading in that direction. Uh, 
they would be especially useful remedies for relatively low off people, uh, especially in negative value claims. I don't think that phrase was used at the time. And that there was a need to have this for practicality and efficiency reasons. Um, something to keep in mind though, and I think Arthur alluded to this, is that at the time the 1966 amendments sprang into uh, being, there were very, very few class actions. And as he said, we were mostly worrying about um, B2, using uh, class actions to facilitate uh, civil rights type cases. Um, but what ends up happening, as we all know, is that during the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, states in common law uh, developments became uh, quite increasingly pro-favorable. Strict products liability comes in. Uh, on the federal side, we have all kinds of new federal statutes granting rights to private um, parties. Uh, so we had an explosion, our inventive <coughs> plaintiff's bar, there's an explosion of class actions, people learning how to use Rule 23b3 to bring damages class actions to enforce all these new state law, common law remedies, and federal remedies. So of course there had to be the pendulum swinging. Uh, we end up having the rise of class actions, at first antitrust securities, other federal class actions, but then increasingly starting in 1979 being used in mass tort cases and personal injury cases. Um, so during the rest of the 1980s until about the 1990s we had this phenomenon of mass torts, I guess we could call that the golden age. Uh, but then Judge Posner, who has since become uh, Arthur Miller's hero at the time starts putting the brakes on the motion uh, in the Rhone polling case. And uh, he talked there about how class actions, the nuclear bomb over the head of the defendants, and you know, we can't have that. Uh, this idea was picked up in AMCHEM in the context of a settlement class uh, and Ortiz. And then later on in the last few years, we had the Walmart case, the Comcast case, and the Concepcion case. Uh, we had constant efforts to amend uh, the federal rules to try to deal with this process. Um, I think Rick alluded to the problem in the 1998 amendments. All that got through was Rule 23F. None of the other more radical solutions, opting in, uh, all of those kinds of things, uh, were, were, were too politically sensitive to get in. Uh, the latest rounds of significant amendments did some really, really good to try to, to, try to tighten up the rule, Rule 23G. Uh, appointing of class counsel, Rule 23F, trying to get judges to take greater control over um, uh, attorney's fees. And then, of course, we've always had Rule 23E, which requires the court in a class action to um, approve the settlement. We had the Class Action Fairness Act that came in in 2005. So a lot of things happened to start pushing the pendulum back towards the plaintiff side. Uh, but where are we today? Basically, it seems like everybody's unhappy. Um, and it seems that it's going to be really, really difficult to do anything about the problem because of the power of conclusion, uh, uh, preclusion. And, and what this has to do with our topic is that it seems to me that Rule 23b3 is never not going to be controversial because it touches on substance. And I think Marty Reddish is absolutely correct about that. Uh, and therefore, the debate is very interest driven. On the other hand, as I've mentioned, in the real world, it's true that class settlements are still viable. The courts of appeals are, are affirming them. Um, I think it's also true today that global resolution can protect defendants, does protect defendants, uh, but I think the efficiencies and the across-the-board treatment uh, for like individuals that can be achieved in uh, group litigation uh, can provide not only efficiencies but fairness. But the problem then is whether Rule 23 does a good enough job of protecting class members in general, futures, or even current. Um, do opt-out rights do the job? Well, we have objectors. We haven't talked about objectors yet, but this is another form of capitalism, I guess. Maybe objectors are even less socialist than the beginning plaintiff's lawyers. Um, we also sometimes have class members taking matters into their own hands. Maybe some of you read about the Honda case last year, uh, where a woman who was very dissatisfied with the offer that Honda made over the gas mileage representations of their um, hybrids, took it on herself to go to small claims court and got a higher, much higher settlement than she would have if um, she had stuck with um, the class. Her uh, award was subsequently overturned, but you know there is that possibility. There's also <laughs> the role of collateral attack. 
the Stevenson case, which came out of the Second Circuit that uh, went up to the United States Supreme Court uh, that was affirmed on a 4-4, is a really important case that is, is, is not discussed very much. Um, and it deals directly with the problem of futures because what you had in that case, it arose out of the Agent Orange settlement, which I think was in 1980, 1984, 1987, something like that. Um, and what happened is there were at least two persons who had served in the military in Vietnam uh, who, who finally manifested their injury, but after the fund had been shut down, all the money was gone. Uh, and uh, so Judge Weinstein, of course, said, well, you're a member of the class, and by definition, these fellows were members of the class. Um, but they argued that they weren't adequately represented, and the Second Circuit bought the argument. Uh, so if the fund runs out, um, a collateral attack will ensue. Uh, there is a bit of a split in the circuits on this, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting case. You've seen the same concept picked up in the context of um, 524G trusts in the asbestos litigation, combustion engineering. Uh, so I think this idea that if defendants don't put enough money up, then they will be subject to collateral attack. So the settlements better be good enough or um, the global peace that defendants think they have achieved, um, they will not have achieved. I had a slide in here um, that I was gonna give you and this is a picture of Arthur Miller. Um, <laughs> and uh, the title of the slide was The Still Young Punk. Um, so when the advisory committee was trying to think about what to do with B3 back leading up to the 1998 amendments, um, Francis Fox, one of the members of the committee said, back in 1963, if you knew what was going to happen over the next 31 years, would you not have ripped up B3 entirely and told Ben Kaplan, this is just too much trouble. We shouldn't manufacture this. Arthur Miller, in 63, I might have said that. I was a young punk kid. So I guess we don't have the complete answer from Arthur Miller about what we should do. But I think we have to start thinking about options, some options with Rule 23b3. And my position there is that let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, maybe the opt-in idea should be revisited. I don't know. I don't think that works. Uh, but maybe another idea that was bandied about in 1998 is worth thinking about. And I think Linda might be talking about this a little bit. Um, I don't know how we do this, but perhaps we should be thinking about distinguishing between high value claims and so-called negative value claims. Um, I think that the Supreme Court has actually already largely done this. The decision in AmChem, I think for personal injury cases, pretty much does away with the idea of settlement, B3 settlement classes um, for at least personal injury and perhaps other high valued claims. Um, and there's actually already language in Rule 23 that allows the courts to exercise their good judgment uh, to refuse to, to allow certification in classes of high value because the individual, one of the factors they're supposed to consider is whether the individual um, has an interest in controlling their own litigation and perhaps that should be invoked more frequently. Um, I also think that disaggregation can be good. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is serving with uh, Ed Sherman over here as the reporter of an ABA task force on the asbestos litigation. And uh, we held hearings in Washington, D.C. and in, um, uh, at my school, Loyola, in Los Angeles. And we heard from Judge Rebrano, who is running the MDL 875, and we heard from Judge Davidson, who is the MDL judge in Texas, uh, and most states that have a fairly large population of or, or docket of asbestos claims basically have a mini MDL with a strong judge overseeing it. And so what was amazing to me, or sort of interesting to me, because I've been a, an apologist for aggregation for a long time, is that maybe disaggregation is good. Uh, that especially with these high value claims, sure MDL under section 1407, sure achieve the efficiencies of pretrial, but get the cases ready for trial. Don't be so obsessed with settling them at this point, but rather ready them for trial, strict trial dates, and let them let them go home and have their cases tried. Now, this is especially important in the case of a dying mesothelioma victim, uh, but I think it's something to think about. MDL litigation has come to be known as the black hole in many cases because judges have been taught, talked about the Federal Judicial Center, that settlement is good. 
Well, maybe cases ready to be tried is even better. Uh, probably the case will settle on the courthouse door, so you don't really have to worry about settling it, but this is something that should be considered. In terms of negative value claims, um, I don't see that there are a lot of good alternatives, and I'll talk about some of them. Um, I think that notice and opportunity to opt out, ironically, are, are basically no use in these negative value claims. As Arthur said this morning, only a lunatic, or maybe he said Judge Posner would say, only a lunatic uh, would go it alone for a low value claim. And this will not make Marty Reddish very happy, but I would say, who cares? Because they're going to get something, and perhaps I just got $70 in the mail. So perhaps the technology is actually going to help get us around the, I used to call it Cypre, but that's because I maybe live on the other side of the tracks. Um, so I'll start with the Cypre. I had the same thing with Arthur Miller a number of years ago. I always thought it was Daubert, but he said it was Daubert. But anyway, putting all that aside, um, okay, I'm running out of time. The things that we should be thinking about, public agency enforcement versus private enforcement, I think that's impossible. We're not going to pay more taxes. We have always had a distrust of judgment, uh, of, of government. Um, mass actions, quasi-class uh, actions, there's none of the Rule 23 protections. Bankruptcy, we've seen a mess. Uh, just one last thing and then I'll be quiet. What I see is possibly the way of the future is the parents' patriae action. After Hood, uh, that, that Arthur talked about this morning, we have the possibility of something that looks like a class action staying in state courts for the prosecution of state law claims. Uh, now maybe we'll see the same excesses that have dro are driving defendants uh, kind of crazy because we'll see kind of a, a combining of the private bar working for the attorneys general. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of options and I look forward to what my colleagues have to say about them. I want to focus on the BP oil spill case in addressing the issues of class settlements and who benefits defendants or plaintiffs. Think back a moment uh, a couple of years ago. You probably saw on the news for the first time that there had been an explosion uh, in an oil rig, drilling oil rig uh, in the Gulf of Mexico some 50 miles uh, south of Louisiana. And then we were treated for almost 90 days of drama as to what would be done about this. Uh, at first, uh, there was some optimism that not a great deal of oil was uh, being ejected, and then uh, the estimates uh, were increased. And uh, each night, we would see a, a picture of an oil slick uh, first uh, around the immediate area of the oil rig, and then it grew and grew and grew. And pretty soon we were told that uh, the oil slick was now hitting the shores of the five states uh, that uh, bordered on, uh, on the northern uh, Car uh, Caribbean and Gulf. And um, it, it was quite a drama because uh, there were a number of issues. There was, of course, the explosion, which uh, some seven individuals died, but thereafter it was pretty much an issue of economic loss as those, the oil spill reached the shores, uh, the impact it was having on real estate. It had already shut down the fisheries, uh, the lobstermen, the, the oil, the, the oystermen, uh, the shrimpers, the fishermen who could no longer fish in a growing area of the Gulf. Uh, it, it affected the tourist industry. The tourists stopped coming uh, to that area. And uh, th there was a larger economic loss across uh, the, the, uh, that part of the Gulf. Well, within a short time, uh, 10,000 lawsuits were filed in, in uh, all five of the states. And then that number grew. And uh, at some point, uh, it was brought to the attention of the panel on multi-district litigation. It was proposed that uh, all of those lawsuits uh, be consolidated and sent to a, a single jurisdiction. 
Uh, BP wanted it to be sent to a federal court in uh, Southern District of Texas because that was BP's headquarters. Uh, the uh, plaintiffs wanted it to be in Louisiana because the largest harm had been received, accepted in uh, Louisiana. And uh, so it was ultimately sent to a federal judge in uh, the Eastern District of Louisiana. Uh, it started out with uh, the, the cases that were sent, and of course there were tag-along cases. And within a short time, there were, there were uh, tens of thousands of cases before the MDL judge. The MDL judge uh, set about doing what an MDL judge does. He appointed a plaintiff steering committee and various liaison committees for the defendants and the plaintiffs. Uh, and uh, he set about uh, setting up a structure for negotiation and hopefully settlement, hoping that he could achieve a settlement before uh, the pretrial was completed and he had to send the cases back uh, to, uh, to the uh, courts in which they had been originally filed. Uh, the, the, the judge put a lot of uh, pressure on the parties and uh, uh, negotiations began. They, they lasted uh, over a year and ultimately there was a settlement. Uh, as far as a class action, a number of the individual cases had uh, sought a class status and so there were competing lawyers who wanted cl uh, class, uh, class and wanted to be the class representatives. But this was a case in which uh, the defendant, uh, as uh, has already been heard, was particularly interested in class certification because BP wanted to resolve all the claims against it in one global settlement. And. Uh, after uh, about a year of negotiation, uh, Judge Barbier, the federal judge, started to uh, put the feet to the fire. Uh, he started setting deadlines and even set a trial date. The parties didn't want to do that. And finally, just uh, days before the, the uh, first hearing for the trial was supposed to happen, there was a global settlement. The, uh, <clears throat> it was a complicated case. Uh, one, one of the issues before, on appeal, which, uh, which was decided last week by the Fifth Circuit, was whether it was a good class action. And that's not an easy question because this is a complicated, complex case. And all the usual issues on, on appeal were raised against the class certification. Lack of predominance of common questions, lack of typicality, uh, inter-class conflicts, uh, in, inability to, uh, to, 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 uh, to provide class-wide evidence of injury, and so forth. Uh, but um, the, the parties uh, both wanted to have a, a class uh, settlement, and so it was presented to the court as a uh, settlement class. Up until that time, the court had not yet ruled on the class certification. And the court, after having a fairness hearing, a complicated for hearing, hearing many witnesses, hearing objectors, uh, after about six months, uh, approved the settlement. The settlement um, uh, provided a whole number of, of features, fairly typical in these kinds of complex settlements. Uh, it, uh, the, the settlement was uh, some 300 pages long. Uh, and uh, as complicated as can be. It was complicated because there were so many different uh, classes, or shall we say subclasses, of claimants. Uh, the different fishing uh, uh, fishermen who had, been, who had suffered economic loss had very different claims depending on what, what geographical area their, their particular fishing was and what kind of fishing they were doing. Uh, uh, for, for fish, shrimp, oysters, or so forth. Uh, economic loss, uh, uh, in terms of the riparian owners, uh, there were hotels that had, and, and resorts all along the coast that uh, ha had lost business. Some of them closed down for some period of time. 
There are restaurants, uh, th there were all kinds of tourist industry uh, businesses, and they all claimed uh, some kind uh, of loss. And somehow it was necessary to set a framework in, in the settlement as to how these would be treated very differently. What they ended up doing is drawing geographical loans uh, uh, areas. They, they called them A, B, C, and D. <laughs> the closest one was, was um, uh, very close to, uh, to the water's edge. And then B was a, a few miles back and a few miles back uh, until they finally uh, uh, dealt with people quite some distance. And they realized uh, the difficulty of this because, for example, uh, there were um, service stations hundreds of miles from the Gulf that claimed that they had lost business because the tourist industry had shut down along the Gulf because of the oil spill. Uh, there were um, restaurants in New York City that had specialized in Gulf, various kinds of, of Gulf uh, fish and, and uh, uh, oysters. Uh, in fact, they had advertised that they had them and they could no longer have them, and they claimed losses of money. Uh, so the ripple effect of, of economic loss was considerable, and they had to somehow set up a framework that would distinguish between them, and they did. Uh, one of the great problems that they had was causation. Uh, how do you prove, uh, how does the service station prove that the reason that their business fell off for a period of time was because of the oil spill rather than other economic conditions. And there were businesses, in fact, that, uh, uh, that uh, had uh, a decrease in, uh, in their revenues, but there were other things. There were disputes among the partners, uh, various kinds of internal problems that had nothing to do with the oil spill. Well, what the, uh, what the agreement did is it set up a claims process Claims processes are, are central to resolving these kinds of, uh, of uh, MDL and, and, and class actions. Uh, and the claims uh, uh, judge appointed a, a claims administrator, and uh, he, he uh, had a, uh, an office with almost 500 people uh, with uh, sub-offices all over the Gulf uh, that would take the claims. Uh, this followed an earlier claims process that had been set up by BP immediately after the spill, as it's required to do by the Oil Pollution Act and the Clean Water Act. And you'll remember that, uh, uh, that uh, lawyer and, uh, and mediator Ken Feinberg uh, was the claims administrator for that. The uh, plaintiffs were very unhappy. He applied what they considered to be too strict tort standards of causation. Uh, as to payment, uh, there was a backup of claims that were not being paid, and so the settlement uh, replaced uh, the Feinberg claims process with a new, new claims process that was under the direction of the MDL judge, Judge Barbier. Now, uh, up until that time, everything looked pretty sweet. Uh, the, uh, in the six months after the settlement, uh, BP came in numerous times to tell the judge that they were happy with the settlement. There were no problems. And so the judge approved the settlement. Uh, the claims process, meanwhile, was working. Uh, but there, was, uh, there were problems in, in paradise after all. Uh, they, uh, BP had estimated that uh, under the claims process as it was set out, it would cost them about $9.8 billion dollars. And as the claims process got going, they found that claims were being paid uh, that would probably run the, uh, the total cost up until 12, 13, maybe $14 billion. And so there was great concern uh, about the additional cost. At that point, after almost a year of, uh, of approval, BP had decided that they'd had too much. And they decided that it, they started scrutinizing some of the payments of claims where hundreds of thousands of dollars of claims were paid uh, for companies uh, that uh, sh showed a loss 
in one particular time period in 19 in 2010 but but uh, a prophet at a later time and they were and uh, the claims administrator was not uh, using a, a, an accrual method of tying together the costs and expenses and BP claimed that in fact people were being compensated who had no injury resulting from the oil spill uh, BP uh, the big company is able to do this uh, uh, ginned up quite a public relations campaign uh, they're still running those ads, full-page ads in the New York Times and other places. Uh, and uh, here's a, a cover of a, a Bloomberg Business Week uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it says, BP is getting rolled in the Gulf. Um, a claim that, in fact, uh, under the claims process, there was a, 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 a lack of, of causation to the oil spill and that, agree, and that was not what agree, was agreed upon. Well, the problem was that, in fact, uh, the settlement set out some rather precise criteria for determining <coughs> economic loss. Uh, a period would be, uh, would be uh, established uh, prior to the spill uh, in, in 2010, and then the uh, claimant uh, could establish a period in 2011 to compare, and if in fact there was a loss between that period of time, uh, then that would be considered to be a loss. And in fact, the uh, settlement specifically said that they recognized that a formula was necessary to determine economic loss because causation would be so difficult to prove on an individual basis. If you had 50,000 claimants, each of, which, each of whom had to uh, prove the causation of their particular economic loss, uh, it would, uh, you would have to break down into individual hearings, claims hearings, and everyone realized that that would uh, draw the claims process out for a very long time. It was in BP's interest also to get this behind them. In fact, that was the reason that they, that they pushed uh, for the settlement. Uh, they wanted to get it off of the front pages of the newspaper, uh, and they could uh, feed into the public relations campaign that BP is doing the right thing in the Gulf. But at some point, uh, their lawyers or BP's Directors decided that, that in fact, uh, that <coughs> uh, formula that was resulting in some people getting, apparently getting a windfall uh, was costing too much. And so BP un, uh, suddenly changed course. They, uh, they sought a preliminary injunction to the, fifth, to the judge that was denied and appealed up to the Fifth Circuit against the claims administrator saying that he was misinterpreting the claims process agreement. Uh, a, a panel, a, a three-judge panel, on a two-to-one vote actually, ruled in favor of, uh, of that preliminary injunction, saying that, in fact, they couldn't have really intended that just because you met these formula criteria, that nonetheless you could recover even if, in fact, uh, uh, causation, in fact, was not proven. It was sent back to the, the judge. The judge entered a partial order to the, uh, uh, to the uh, claims administrator, but not reversing uh, essentially the formula determination. <coughs> and meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, the appeal from the court's uh, approval of the class settlement was going forward to a different panel of the Fifth Circuit. And last week, uh, that panel uh, d decided in favor of the claimants and, and against BP. So we have an interesting situation of two different panels of, of, of the Fifth Circuit uh, disagreeing, and uh, uh, it'll have to be resolved in some way, maybe by an en banc hearing or something of that kind. And, and uh, I, I think what, what this shows us is that even the best-intentioned settlements 
those settlements in which both parties were, were uh, <coughs> in agreement at, at the time uh, because the complexity of, of determining claims <laughs> and economic losses are terribly difficult uh, to, 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 to control. Uh, there's uh, the possibility, finally, of, of not ultimately resolving cases. Thank you. Well, as every law professor in the room can appreciate, we've hit the dead hour of the afternoon. <laughs> I feel like telling everybody to stand up and stretch. So mm -hmm. people in the front row are falling asleep. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on in the back of the room, but everybody's nodding off there. All right. <laughs> Just the students. <laughs> <laughs> Just the students. <laughs> um, all right, so the theme of this panel um, is, is kind of focused on settlement, and almost um, all the academics who have been invited to participate today um, have been thinking about and working on um, class actions probably over a 30 or 40 year span, as have I. And um, I've taken to calling myself a recovering aggregationist. Um, just by way of um, personal uh, biography, um, I want you to know that uh, I went through college uh, in the 1960s during the days of rage and revolution. Um, I was highly influenced by having gone through college during that period. I definitely was a hippy-dippy person. Um, I believed in social justice. It's what inspired me to go to law school. Um, I idealized the class action rule. I thought it was just absolutely terrific. So the question is, what has happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> and I think what's happened to me is watching what's happened with class action litigation over the arc of time. And by the way, when you're talking about class action litigation, the reality today is you're really talking about class action settlement. And because I've become increasingly disenchanted with the landscape of class action settlement, and even worse, the landscape of non-class action settlements, um, uh, this has impelled me to basically um, rethink uh, a lot of the problems surrounding use of the class action rule. Um, the paper that I'm writing um, is entitled Ending Class Actions as We Know Them, A Failed American Experiment. Um, and again, I'm coming from the position of being a true believer. Um, there are four points that I want to make in my talk. Um, so this is just to give you a roadmap of where I'm going. First of all, I want to talk to you about the fact that class action discourse um, has been dominated and continues to be dominated by what I will call a romantic narrative. And I'm going to tell you what are the characteristics of that romantic narrative. And I want to suggest to you that the romantic narrative is really probably not true. Um, my second point is that class actions as they are currently implemented um, do not effectuate the three primary goals um, that class actions say that um, they are there to achieve and accomplish. My third point is to call for um, a radical reform of the class action rule. And that's why I'm saying ending class actions as we know them. I do have a proposal for what that would look like. It would severely limit class actions in scope and application. And then my fourth point is in making this proposal, I do not by any means mean to endorse a number of the alternatives that have been suggested by various people today, um, including non-class settlement mechanisms, quasi-class actions, what's going on in MDLs. Um, this morning, Marty Reddish made the suggestion, he could not help himself, that class actions were um, to some extent lawless. Um, he knows that I agree with that critique. My point is, if he thinks class actions are lawless, all of these alternative mechanisms, to me, are even more lawless, if that's possible. So that's where I'm going with this. All right, so I want to talk to you about the romantic narrative that I think is dominating the discourse. And by the way, nobody does the romantic narrative of class actions better than Arthur Miller. Okay, the entire one-hour talk he gave today was the romantic narrative. 
So let me tell you what the features are of the romantic narrative of the class action. First of all, and foremost, in the front, it features downtrodden, exploited, uneducated, disarmed little guys, other known as the schlubs, okay? Those are the schlubs out there. Pitted against evil, malevolent, awful, bad actors, okay, who are typically corporate defendants. In addition, okay, in thinking about um, these two actors, um, the narrative involves a description of asymmetrical power and resources. Little guy pitted against corporate defendant that has unending resources to crush the little guy. Um, another feature of the romantic narrative is that in the absence of the class action rule, um, uh, people will have no means for the effective vindication of their rights. And at this point in this movie, okay, this drama, what you have to do is cue in the plaintiff's lawyers who appear with a white cowboy hat on a white stallion coming to the rescue of the downtrodden and cue in also the desperados, okay, or the defendants all dressed in black. So that's kind of the narrative. Now, the narrative, another portion of the romantic narrative um, is to talk about the paradigm class actions. And this, um, in talking about this, and, and I've seen plaintiff's lawyers do this over and over again um, at uh, particularly uh, attorney forums uh, for class actions. Um, they harken back to what I call the golden age of class actions. So when they talk about class actions, they talk about the era um, after the enactment of the 66 reform for about a decade. Um, and I've heard plaintiff's lawyers say, you know, remember when you're talking about class actions, Brown versus Board of Ed, okay, itself was a class action. And what they're talking about basically are the era, this golden era of public interest law um, and institutional reform litigation, again, an era that uh, did inspire me. But it bears um, uh, observation that these were all injunctive relief classes. They were all B2 class actions. They were not B3 damage class actions. But nonetheless, in this narrative, okay, that's the paradigm that's pointed to. All right, and then the last part of this narrative um, is uh, plaintiff's lawyers and their academic um, commentators uh, basically then segue to talking about the recent trends of decisions from the Supreme Court and several lower federal courts uh, to make the point that all of these decisions are absolutely terrible, that they limit access to justice. Um, and when you hear the plaintiff's lawyers talk about this, every time a new decision comes from the Supreme Court, um, they run around basically saying the sky is falling in largely hyperbolic uh, rhetoric. The interesting thing is no matter what the courts do, the plaintiff's lawyers always do effectively regroup and find some way um, of going forward with um, instituting and prosecuting new class actions. All right, so what, from this narrative, I wanna segue, okay, to what I will call the modern class action. Um, and basically what's been going on post the golden age. And what I wanna to suggest to you is we are a long, long way from the golden age of class actions. All right, first of all, class actions are not dead. Okay, anybody who's saying that, it's, it's perfectly silly, and I've written an article basically describing why that's silly. But my point is that they're just badly done. All right, and what's going on in class action litigation is kind of like it's not your mother's class actions from back in the 1960s, right? The landscape has become dominated by the B3 damage class actions. And that's why I think that there's a need for rethinking the class action um, and doing something about it. I think that there's an interesting parallel here, this is kind of a stretch for civil procedure teachers, um, with what we teach as the saga of common law pleading. And when we talk about common law pleading and the revolution of the field code, um, the whole purpose of that is to make the point that pre-notice pleading, common law pleading had become so arcane and complex and difficult, it set up traps for the unwary. And the whole brilliance of the field code was basically to do away with all that and institute a simplified form of notice pleading. Um, and I think in terms of thinking about reforming the class action rule, um, there were interesting analogs there. By the way, one of the major um, revolutionary statements in the field code was the elimination of all the forms of action and the field code begins by saying, there shall be one form of action and it shall be called a civil action. If you know anything about Rule 23 and all the B categories, I've argued in various pieces that these categories have basically have merged in interesting ways. There's no point in having these dis different 
category, so I would begin my new class action rule with the statement, there should be one form of class action and it shall be called a class action and do away with all the categories. All righty, so um, my second point is, why do I think there needs to be radical reform of the class action rule? And that's because I think that the class action rule has basically failed to effectuate the primary rationales for its existence. And these are, in all the literature, cited as three rationales. One is to compensate um, victims of wrongdoing. Um, the second is deterrence, to the de deter the wrongful conduct of bad actors. And the third is to achieve efficiency, um, judicial efficiency uh, and, ec and economy. And, and again, I want to suggest that the class action rule as it's currently implemented doesn't achieve any of these goals. Um, this morning, and a number of people have talked about the Halliburton case, which is currently pending before the Supreme Court. And I think providing some background or some facts about what actually goes on in securities class actions um, at least should give some content to this debate. In a way, securities class actions, the 10b-5s, are really kind of an archetype of the small claims class action designed to protect the small claimant, in this case, the investor. All right, well, I want to give you some interesting um, statistics. First of all, since enactment of the PSLRA, the number of um, securities class actions has increased dramatically through 2012. Um, plaintiffs filed 3,988 securities actions, but what you need to know is only 14 of these went to verdict. That's one-third of 1%. In addition to which, securities fraud actions poorly compensate their alleged victims. Between 1996 and 2010, the median settlements in these securities actions returned only 2.8% of plaintiffs' losses, and in 2012, the number was even lower, 1.8%. And these numbers are before taking into account the huge transaction costs of doing these cases, such as attorney fees, litigation expenses, insurance, um, and so on. Okay, the other point, um, and by the way, this is all lots of documented studies by people in the securities field. Securities actions also do not deter um, the culpable parties, all right? Um, the, ter the deterrent effect in securities actions is muted because the corporation and its insurers, rather than the corporation's culpable agents, pay these settlements. Culpable individuals pay less than a half of 1% of settlements. The insurers pay about 68% and the companies pay about 31%. It is extremely rare for executives or directors to pay personally from any of their own assets. Um, and so basically this regime where the innocent pay and the guilty do not undermines deterrence. With regard to the efficiency argument, okay, securities class actions basically um, have been shown to consume excessive judicial resources. Um, 60 to 70 percent of the uh, securities class actions that settle require more than three years to resolve and 20 percent take more than five years. Anyway, there's lots and lots of criticisms of what's going on um, in that arena. Um, I think that in considering the romantic narrative relating to, um, to class action litigation, it fails to give due credit to the downside consequences of what goes on either um, during the class certification process or during settlement. And it's worth thinking about these to ask whether or not um, class actions um, uh, especially in the settlement arena, outweigh the beneficial effects. I think there's a good argument to be made that class litigation involves a great deal of waste, delay, and large-scale inefficiencies, all of which undermine the, um, the goals of ru Rule 1. Um, uh, Professor Reddish has written about this. Class actions tend to inspire um, the cohort of entrepreneurial lawyers stirring up litigation. Uh, Marty Reddish has written about these as bounty hunters. Class actions, and particularly class action settlements, has been shown in a great deal of literature to invite unethical um, conduct. There are principal agency problems, problems of collusion, problems of selling out class members. This morning, Marty Reddish uh, talked about third-party financing, which basically leads to commodification of these claims. We're not too far off from these things being securitized. Um, class action litigation um, is also litigation breeding with regard to um, lots and lots of litigation, either during the certification process or over settlements when 
objectors um, up, up here. In addition to these kinds of downsides to what's going on, um, there's problems with Rule 23 in and of itself. Um, first of all, before you even get into the Rule 23 requirements, there are implicit requirements, and there are huge problems um, in class action jurisprudence, right, which is now enormous, right? So there are debates in the court decisions over problems relating to ascertainability, proper class definitions, standing, uh, the problems of C4 limited issues classes, commonality, cohesion of the class. Um, I've talked about the fact that there is basically a, um, a merging of the different class categories. Some of the class categories are perfectly moribund. Nobody can bring a Rule 23B1B limited fund class action after Ortiz, right? That was in 1999. You'd look long and hard to find a limited fund class action. Nobody knows what a 23B1A class action is, and it's hard to find one of those even certified. So that gives us the B2s and the B3s. Um, there's multiple problems with settlement classes that have already been talked about. Um, and then you have, again, for certain types of class actions, like securities class actions, special exceptions like the fraud on the market presumption, which gives um, a benefit um, to um, class action plaintiffs. Alrighty, so what would my new class action rule look like? What would this radical approach um, uh, basically entail. I think that there's a good case to be made for the fact that the three different B categories no longer make any sense. Um, I also, and this is absolute blasphemy, ask you to think about what would the world look like without a B3 damage class action. This morning, Professor Miller ended his talk by saying he could not possibly envision a universe, a landscape, okay, that would take us back to where the world was flat. I can envision such a landscape, and looking at it, I want to suggest to you that it would not be flat. And a lot of people have also talked about what's going on in the rest of the world, and I think that's very provocative, because I have looked at what's going on in the rest of the world. And in the rest of the world, okay, there is movement to mechanisms for collective redress. But in all the countries they've done this, and it really is worldwide, they have specifically rejected the American class action model. They have rejected damage class actions. Almost uniformly, most of these models do recognize injunctive relief classes um, brought under certain kinds of, of circumstances. It's a function of American exceptionalism that we think we do everything better than the rest of the world, including our class action. And I want to suggest to you that there are other models out there that might have a lot to recommend for them. So anyway, I invite you to think about, and I have thought a lot about, and I know what it would look like, what would the world look like without our damaged class action? Um, I don't, and by the way, there have been, there was uh, the last go around that the advisory committee um, took this up, they, there was a proposal to include a provision recognizing settlement classes. I just want to suggest to you that settlement classes are precisely the locus of where most of the problems with class action litigation goes on. I would eliminate settlement classes. I would also eliminate coupon settlements went out, but the plaintiff's lawyers have found ingenious ways to come up with coupon settlements, not calling them coupon settlements. Down in Texas, we call it Cypre. We also say voir dire. Um, <laughs> I would eliminate, okay, Cypre. I'm on, I'm on the same page with you um, with that. So what would my class action look like? It would have one form of class action. I would retain what used to be the B2, class actions for injunctive relief. All right, I would do everything I could to eliminate the, uh, the current financing and fee regimes. Um, and. I have a whole, I'm running out of time, we're running way over. Um, but I do have a bunch of alternative um, proposals for what I would put in, the play, in place of gutting the current class action rule. Um, my final note is I would remind you, okay, uh, Professor Miller, some of us have heard him over and over again, talks about the original, he was present at the creation of the 1966 rule. What civil procedure teachers know is Rule 23 is a very interesting example of something unusual in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And my distinguished colleagues here can correct me if I'm wrong on this. But I think Rule 23 is the only rule in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure where the advisory committee actually threw out the original rule. Okay, they scraped it and they did a root and branch and they said it's so bad and so dysfunctional, we have to write a new rule, right? 
it can be done, or it, it absolutely can be done. There's no reason not to. And my suggestion is it's worth thinking about what the world would look like, okay, and, and how that would work. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, we have some time for uh, questions and comments, and I think as we did this morning, uh, it would be helpful first to give the panelists an opportunity to respond to each other or to question each other. I have a question for Linda. <laughs> I thought you were going to talk more about the even more lawless alternatives. And so if you do away with settlement classes entirely, um, then isn't it the case that we are, are you going to get rid of 1407 as well? And um, you know, aggregate settlements. I mean, aren't lawyers going to do that? And uh, isn't that worse? Um, okay, well, the first, this compound question, counselor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Objection sustained. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I obviously wouldn't do away with 1407, but you've been around for as long as I have. In 1407, there was not a lot of action in 1407, and we lived in a world where there was not a lot of action in 1407. What happened over time, okay, over the arc of time is when, <laughs> when both the plaintiffs were being frustrated by their ability to certify class actions in the federal courts, and the defendants wanted to settle with the plaintiffs' lawyers. They hit on this brilliant new technique, which was to take everything into the MDL, right? And that's why we've had this astronomical uptick of cases going into MDL. It is now the preferred forum. Why do they like it? They like it precisely because it's become the forum for negotiating non-class settlements, right? And that favors both sides of the docket. So that's why I think it's, it's those settlements have huge amounts of problem. I do think it's a trend towards lawlessness. Um, so no, I would not do away with 1407, but I think it's, it's a different problem, which is what do you do now, okay, that the, the, one of the prevailing models has become, we're not gonna even bother with the class action, but we're just gonna immediately default to non-class settlements. Um, I have to agree with uh, Arthur Miller's um, romantic view, and uh, much as my uh, good friends uh, Linda and Marty, who are now uh, uh, anti-class action warriors of the most intense kind, uh, raise issues, I, I think that ultimately th their complaint uh, is uh, against uh, th the damage class actions un under B3. Uh, and that really uh, mirrors the uh, views of uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, and business organizations that are anti-liability of any kind uh, and feeling that this is an imposition on business. Uh, the consumer class action has some problems, but the consumer class action is very important, it seems to me, in keeping our, our, our business uh, is straight. The truth is uh, we as a country uh, uh, are, are not inclined to give the kinds of regulatory powers and even more resources to our regulatory agencies to regulate various uh, kinds of business enterprise. We've done it instead through consumer protection statutes that are passed by our states. And that is a very important uh, 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 right uh, that really does keep uh, businesses uh, straight in many ways. Uh, Linda quite correctly said that the objective of the class action is not only compensation, but it is deterrence. And that's why, in fact, uh, I'm bothered by the complaints about the fact that if you have a very low dollar value uh, consumer action in which everybody, uh, every class member will be entitled to only $30, and the lawyers, having spent years and years of full time on the case, uh, get, uh, get millions and millions of dollars, that there's something wrong with that. Uh, I, I think the class action is working, in fact, in providing that kind of check on various kinds of business activities. The same thing uh, with uh, CPRE. I believe that, uh, in, in fact, uh, if it costs more to distribute the checks for $30 to, to a million class members, 
There is nothing objectionable to uh, uh, selecting a, uh, a charity or non-governmental organization that will serve the particular purpose of an environmental case, uh, an environmental group that will, that will uh, uh, work in putting in green spaces and so forth. Uh, and that's efficient and it provides the kind of deterrence so that uh, the bad actors who've acted this way will be on notice that they won't get their money back uh, uh, if there's not a Cypre. Okay, I, I need to respond to that. First of all, <laughs> being accused of being the voice of the Chamber of Commerce, <laughs> that's like a really, well, <laughs> that's a really low blow there, Ed. <laughs> 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 no, I am not associated with any of whatever it is you're putting out there. Um, you know, first, first, part of the romantic narrative of the class action is the conclusory assertion of the people who present this romantic narrative that class actions deter, okay, the behavior of defendants. To which my response is, no empirical proof. You keep saying this. You cannot show me a study, okay, that documents that any class action settlement has a deterrent effect on the, con you, you just say it in a conclusory fashion, okay? Um, and the second thing is we also do not have very good empirical studies on actual compensation to individuals who are claimants in class actions. The best we can get, okay, is some reporting of an aggregate settlement amount, but you never know what is going back to individual claimants, and I have a real problem with that. And we also know, okay, that in claims made settlements where somebody has to file a claim, there is a very, very low redemption rate. So what I'm suggesting to you is there is something really out of kilter, okay, with what we're doing here and the perpetuation of this romantic narrative that this is really, really great for the claimants. I think class actions are great for the plaintiff's lawyers. I think they're great for the corporate defendants who go into settlement mode, okay, with the plaintiff's lawyers who can cut a deal that is favorable to the defendants. I think that class actions are not great for claimants. And our inquiry as a matter of social justice ought to be focused on what actually goes back to claimants. Are claimants receiving any kind of justice? Because I don't believe in that anymore, okay, <laughs> that is what has happened to me over my arc of watching class actions. And as I said, they're not your, your grandmother's class actions anymore, all right? I have nothing against the B2 injunctive class actions. I think those are mechanisms for achieving huge social justice, not the B3 damage class actions. Um, I'm also somewhat I'm concerned about the deterrent function, and I don't have proof that it works, but I am convinced that not having them won't work either. So to me, the question is, what's going to substitute um, for the class action to the extent that it does deter wrongdoing? But let me, before you respond, which I would like to hear, uh, I also have a narrower point, which is when you were explaining, Linda, why... Um, the B3 class action doesn't achieve deterrence. You said that 60-something percent of the judgment is paid by the insurers and the wrongdoers pay virtually nothing. Uh, but as a parent of, you know, three young adult drivers, I pay for the insurance. It still matters to me whether they have an accident. So I think the fact that an insurer is paying doesn't mean that there's no deterrent effect. So I, that's the narrower point. Okay, um, and, yeah, I just want to say I didn't mean in absence of having a B3 damage class action that wrongdoers would go unpunished in, in some way, and that's not my point at all, and I did have a, a whole other segment of my presentation, okay, that was going to deal with what my alternatives are, okay, including um, enhanced regulatory um, mechanisms, but there are lots of other alternatives that are not the B3 damage class action. I just didn't have time <laughs> yeah. to um, go into that portion of my paper. Uh, there are some papers out there that will answer perhaps one of your uh, points. There, there's been some research done um, by empirical people, not law people, or maybe they're JDs, but anyway, showing that uh, private enforcement through class actions is more effective than public enforcement. Um, but that might be begging the question about whether public enforcement is effective at all. 
Um, the other thing is, and I was serious about just getting the $70 in the mail, I didn't have to do anything. It showed up. So maybe technology will be helpful in these consumer class actions if we continue to have them. Um, our banks know who we are. Uh, there's all kinds of information out there, uh, the NSA perhaps, um, so, you know, they, they know who we are, they know what we buy, they know our email addresses, and uh, checks have been showing up in my mailbox, so I'm serious that maybe, you know, that'll answer the see, pray part of the problem. Money will actually be distributed. Okay. Well, it's 2.30. Tim, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience? Maybe one or two. Are there questions from the audience? Yeah, I have one question. It might be a little bit narrow, but in talking about securities litigation, I'm wondering if that's really representative of all other sorts of cases with the corporate directors maybe not paying out of their, their own pockets. That might be uh, a special situation where, where the actual guilty people are not paying themselves, but maybe that doesn't apply across the board. I don't know, so maybe it might not be the most representative kind of case. Do you think there's any validity to that, or do you think it is representative of most class actions? Well, no, no it's not representative of most class actions, but I think it's, it's a good um, paradigm or analogy, and it is used, okay, by the romantic narrative, okay, it's the classic case, you know, of the little guy, okay, um, being harmed. And one of the ironies, by the way, in securities litigation is, <laughs> and this is in my paper, um, the people who are most hurt are the long-term investors who hold, okay? <laughs> and they may not be encompassed by the period when the alleged misrepresentation occurs. And so what you have is a small group of people benefiting, whereas the people who have been holding for a long time wind up paying those people. So you've got people you know, in the investor class who should be being protected, who are actually having to pay, okay, other people in the class. And again, I find that really untenable. But nonetheless, the mythology, the romance is, this is a great thing for the small guy. And all I'm trying to say is not true. Time for one more question from the audience, if we have any. Uh, Professor Molnix, I'd just like to uh, ask you a little, press you a little, press you a little bit more on this narrative um, idea. Because it, it's true that everyone offers a narrative and makes these moral judgments and cost benefit judgments in the context of a narrative. And you are offering your own narrative um, grounded counter -narrative. in- Counter-narrative. Counter-narrative, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> grounded in uh, facts and empirics. And, and so we sort of transition to an argument over facts of deterrence and the like. And, and I would just also say that narratives beg normative and moral judgments, you know, the, of weighing the one or few cases where the little guy is able to prevail on the $30 claim. And this entails moral judgments about the cost and benefit of vindicating that mass action or class action against the cost of a few stray plaintiff's lawyers. And so these narratives are fraught with moral implications, and it sounds like there's still work to be done in establishing the empirics of the narratives. I agree. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like uh, behalf of Emory Law School to thank our four, our four panelists for four tremendous uh, presentations. And I must say, uh, we don't have time to hear everything they have to say. I'm sorry, there's so much meat that each one of them brought to us. But there will be papers. <laughs> And as somebody who's written a few law review articles of his own, I urge you to read them when they come out. I think uh, there'll be much more to hear and learn.